Uh, we've gotten a lot of emails, people out there. Miguel, you're one of them that love it when I botch the intro and Lars yells at me. Well, I say nay, nay, not this time, because today on the wrestling perspective, I'm bringing my A game. That's right. Lars Fredrickson out on tour. Look down below. You see his tour dates. He's there. He's hailing from parts unknown. Lars, what's up, my friend? Well, you know what, Dennis? It's uh -oh. obviously you just haven't taken a taken a drink yet today. That's that's probably why you're speaking so clear, because we, we all know that, you know, like yeah. Matt Hardy, you've had your your moments. You're the Matt Hardy of podcasts. Thank so you. We, you we, we never we never know if you're coming or going. You know <laughs> what I mean? I, I I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that might no be problem. the nicest thing you said to me in an intro in such a long time. Uh, well, you know what else. But uh, believe it or not, we've gotten a lot of email. They're like, we love it when Lars yells at Dennis. Not today, buddy. Not today. So anyways, uh, we have somebody I'm super excited to talk to. Huge fan of his. I've loved him. I want to say he came on my radar in probably 2015 with Ring of Honor. It's Ian Riccoboni. Ian, thank you so much for sitting down and hanging out with our shenanigans today. Hey, Dennis. Hey, Lars. I, you know, it's my pleasure. It's been a whirlwind couple of weeks and months, and there's been some uncertainty, but it looks like everything's going to work out all right. And I appreciate you. You know, I, I, I'm very honored to, to come on here with y'all. Well, don't be that honored. You haven't gotten the interview yet. It's <laughs> you're going to be like Internet connection issues halfway through. Trust yeah. me. We've, we've I get them. I, I get them all the time. <laughs> but listen, I'm I'm just. I mean, we, I'm sorry, Ian, but we've had some duds on here before. Yeah, you know don't, I mean? be so don't don't be one of those fucking guys, okay? <laughs> I shouldn't be. I got I got. I'm at home. I'm not on tour right now, so at, the internet should be good, and we should be all set. I'll listen uh, to him. I'm not out on tour. <laughs> Two out of three people on this podcast are out on tour. One of them's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, listen, Ian, I'm going to jump right in. And this is a question I've been crafting all day for you. And as, as a guy that kind of watches from the outside looking in and your situation with Ring of Honor going on hiatus, not knowing what you're going to do next. And then all of a sudden it feels like you've kind of broken out of this protective shell that you were in when you were with Ring of Honor and you started kind of venturing out and doing other things. In, in retrospect now, do you kind of feel like, at least for you, this hiatus has been great for you because now you feel like I, I'm seeing you do other things and branching out and and I need I say growing a little bit? Yeah, there, there's a little bit of validation, um, you know, to put it in, in kind of a music analogy. One of my one of my favorites is Nick Lowe, and he was with a group, uh, Brinsley Schwartz, and they got a big record deal. Uh, right out of the gate and it wasn't until they got out of that big record deal and that he started working with stiff records and he started you know just venturing out and, and really seeing the world a little bit that he was able to go back and validate some of his earlier you know his earlier songs and records and things like that um for me there's there was kind of this uh there's this disappointment um you know i'm 35 so for about half of my adult life i've, I've been with ring of honor and so uh, as a lifelong pro wrestling fan, as you know, I was, uh, geez, I was 15 years old when, when Ring of Honor started. Uh, I followed them from the beginning, and, and it was really the only place I wanted to be. It, it started in Philadelphia. I'm from up the road in Allentown, and it was kind of the home promotion. So uh, to be able to land in my dream spot and, and kind of take the reins from a guy that I grew up watching, Kevin Kelly, and following his footsteps uh, was something really special. So when I got the news, I thought maybe I, I had sort of a, I don't want to say stench, but maybe I was branded. Maybe I'd be the Ring of Honor guy forever, for better or worse. But um, I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, you know, the first person to reach out was uh, actually Kevin Kelly, who said, hey, I'm going to be in Japan. Would you like to do these uh, New Japan USA shows? I said, sure. Um, Scott Demore reached out. He said, we're going to have Jonathan Gresham in, in Impact. Would you like to call those matches? I said, sure. Uh, and then uh, Brett over at GCW, same thing. And it's been one of these cool things where uh, I had been kind of in a shell. I had been kind of protected uh, for better, for worse. But, you know, I, I've gotten to meet a, a whole new group of people. I think I accidentally joined the gang. I think I joined Nick Gage's gang by accident a couple of weeks ago at the GCW show. So 
it's been neat. It's been uh, it's been very cool. And, uh, you know, it, it's led to um, Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor. And now I kind of want that that branding, that stench of being the, the Ring of Honor guy, because I, I see a lot of growth opportunity and I see um, it was never for effort or talent that Ring of Honor didn't get bigger. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Tony. <clears throat> wow. There we go. Choked up. Yeah, I, I think Tony <laughs> Khan has the resources. I think he has the love for Ring of Honor uh, and, and the appreciation for the history to really see it through and, and to grow it. At least, you know, appreciate the, the back catalog and whatnot, and hopefully with a future vision as well. Well, you know, one of the things that I've noticed about your commentating style, like I feel like you're one of those guys that can fit in in, in, in every kind of company and you can do both sides of the coin, I feel, although you have your stick. Do you, is there, but one of the things I've always wanted to ask a commentator, is there somebody that you still get excited for to call their matches? Um, and if so, like who are, who have those guys been? That's a great question. Um, Bandito is at the top of my list, uh, mostly because I, I never know what he's going to do. Um, Dragon Lee was another wrestler like that in Ring of Honor that mm -hmm. every time he was out, I would get very excited. Um, Jonathan Gresham is pretty neat. I don't like to know the outcomes of the matches. Um, it's something that I feel helps me get more invested and genuinely excited. Um, there was a stretch where Jonathan Gresham, uh, he won 17 out of 19 matches, and 15 of those were decided in different moves or holds or pins. So he's been a guy on my list. But, um, you know, to me, the, the Briscoes ha have been the top of the top for that. Um, they've been uh, consistent through my entire run and ring of honor. And then the young bucks, um, you know, pinnacle of innovation. And I would love to get just at least one more match with the young bucks <laughs> in front of me. I, I, I want to go back and talk about your style and, and opening up your wings. And do you find being the ring of honor voice when you walk into another promotion do you still get to be you or is there a sense that okay this promotion is like a i've got to kind of tilt towards more of a hardcore style of commentary or impact has a different style and maybe i have to kind of uh inch a little bit that way for their fan base what was really neat in impact was tom hannafin uh who also from the philadelphia area uh, one of the guys that I look up to, we're about the same age and he, uh, he had started the same day that I was guesting. And so he was Tom Phillips in WWE and he pulled me aside and said, Hey, we we're bringing you in for you. And he said, you are bringing you in. Cause this is the ring of honor title match. You're the ring of honor announcer. Do nothing different. <laughs> Just take the lead on this. I will get us in and out of the graphics. I'll get us in and out of the, the introductions, but be you. And we're, we're paying you to be you in impact. And then for GCW, uh, I kind of hammed up maybe the, the, uh, the Bob Saget factor where I, I think I, I genuinely have a reputation as just, um, you know, being a dad, you know, if you, if you look at my social media, um, it's wrestling and it, it's, uh, me and my wife taking our kids to the park or the playground or the theme park, or, um, we're, you know, we did big Disney fans. My, most of my family lives in Florida. Now they all moved down there. So we end up at Disney one way or the other. Um, so I, I leaned into that. Uh, I was threatening to curse during the GCW pay-per-view. I got one in at the end. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, that was, God damn, that was great. And then I signed off. So I, yeah, I went there. Yeah, I hit it hard. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they Just must have had, had that, that. Uh, that trigger that, you know, the hand on the, on the button there, the mute button. Uh-oh. Good yeah, old Pops that... is coming in, throwing a goddamn. <laughs> yeah that seven second delay they they really needed it on the pay-per-view so yeah but everywhere i went um you know tony khan just said hey be yourself and uh that's been neat um you know new japan same kind of thing it's uh you know stylistically it has been it's been helpful that kevin kelly has been my mentor over the years it's been helpful that he's brought me in um he's kind of helped craft what i do What's neat about that is he's a descendant of Jim Ross. So Jim Ross is a descendant of Bill Watts. Who's a, and so there's this long learning tree that, mm -hmm. you know, if there's something that, that comes across, um, while I went to school for broadcasting, there's a good chance that it was actually refined or, or 
kind of pushed into me by Kevin Kelly, um, you know, who probably got it from Jim Ross. So there's, there's this cool kind of learning tree all along the way. So I, I've only ever been asked to be myself, which I've been really fortunate because it, I, I'm a bad actor and it'd be really difficult to be anybody else. Well, you know, I always wondered, and maybe you can answer this question. I'm sure you can, but I do know a few commentators and guys, and what I find from them is different answers on this. But do you ever get a chance to really actually know these guys? Do you go on up and ask them questions to help you connect and then therefore, <coughs> excuse me, help connect them to the audience? Because that's in, in essence, somewhat of your job, isn't it? It is. And that's a great question. Um, the group I used, I usually used to travel with, um, it's interesting because we're, we're very di divergent, maybe on the political spectrum and, and things like that. But the folks I got along with the best are, are actually the Briscoes and um, getting to know them and, and their family life and their real life chicken farmers. And, uh, you know, that was really neat because that helped portray the kind of the authenticity that, that came with them. And they were, you know, they were fighting to make money to keep the family business going. And, and that's real. And there's elements of that that are really neat. Um, Bandito's a guy that, that I've traveled with that. Uh, he did turn down offers from different companies along the way. And, and uh, he did turn down sort of being the chosen one in CMLL uh, with Ultimo Guerrero. And so getting to talk to him about that, um, yeah, I'd say the best friends I've made have been, you know, honestly, probably the Briscoes, uh, Caprice Coleman, my partner, uh, PCO. Um, PCO is an incredible story. <laughs> PCO, uh, he's, he's wrestled everybody and anybody in wrestling. So for me, it's, every time I got to travel with him, it was it, it was like a, a birthday gift because I just said, tell me about Bret Hart. Tell me about uh, so and so. But then along the way, you get to know about his family and him wanting to move to the United States and what he's going through. And the you know, here's a relationship with, with Jacques Rougeau and, uh, you know, the time they sold out the Montreal Forum uh, in 1994 when when WWF's business was was kind of down in the dumps. But. Him and Jacques sold out the, you know, the, the forum up there. So it's really neat. Um, I do get to know them on a, on a, on a pretty nice level. Like I'm, I'm going to Matt Taven's wedding uh, in a couple of weeks, which is really exciting. Um, you know, Matt and I became friends over the years. Um, two kind of dedicated Ring of Honor guys. He, he had been in Ring of Honor since 13. I'd bring in Ring of Honor since 14. Started really getting some opportunities in 15. And so the two of us kind of grew up together in Ring of Honor and got to really know him and, and his fiance, Lisa. So we're really excited for their wedding. Um, Maria Bennett and Maria Canales Bennett has offered to come down and babysit so that my wife and I can get a night off. Um, you know, they live out in the Chicago area, so that, that might be tricky, but uh, it's very sweet of her to offer. Uh, but I've gotten to know her and Mikey and, and their kids. Um, their kids are the exact same age as Sarah and I's kids. So we, we trade parent, parenting. Uh, stories of joy and parenting joys of horror <laughs> all along the way wow now i, I gotta ask because i'm sure the internet will go crazy if i don't ask you the the typical ring of honor questions is what have you heard about the rebirth of the brand are you going to be involved have they even talked to you about being involved sure i i haven't talked to the man himself uh, i'll say that um i think there's one guy that that knows what's going on and <laughs> Uh, aside from how you doing, very nice to meet you. Appreciate what you're doing. I'm excited to see where it's going. Um, you know, I, I just, I haven't had the opportunity to, to sit down with him. Um, one of the weird quirks of everything is I'm the last person ever to be under ring of honor contract with Sinclair broadcast. And I still am. So no one knows kind of what my con it, who's if it comes with the sale, um, it hasn't been established yet. Um, if Sinclair is going to buy me out, if they're going to cancel it, uh, if Tony Khan gets it, what, you know, if he wants to take it as is, um, you know, to be very clear, it's a, it's a contract that's performer friendly and it's, it's company friendly. There's some easy outs. So I, I don't anticipate, uh, I don't anticipate getting essentially money for nothing for, for too much longer. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, I've talked to folks in, in Tony Khan's orbit, and I've let them know my phone is on and that I'd love to be a part of what's going on. And um, I've done my best to 
you know, put, put that bug in their ear as much as I can without being annoying and without being uh, a pain in the butt. But I, I know the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So you got to make sure that they know you're out there and that, that you want to do it and that there's no weird feelings or anything like that. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm just keeping my, my uh, voice in the ears of what I think might be the right people at this point. And they, uh, they told me to keep my phone on too. So uh, it look, there looks to be some sort of mutual, on, at least on a small level, uh, maybe a mutual interest to see where it goes. Um, in terms of plans, uh, you know, I only know what, what Tony Khan has said at the press conferences, that he does intend it to be a, a continuation of the program, um, that the storylines and, and the, the history of Ring of Honor is going to continue kind of where it left off. And we saw that at Supercard, there was stories that continued and the titles continued as is. So it, it'll be interesting to see where it picks up. Um, personally, I'm hoping that it's a, uh, that it, it's a weekly television show. For, for me, uh, selfishly, uh, it'd be really cool if it taped once a month so I get as much time with my kids as possible. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm willing to, I'm willing to listen on, on just about everything. I mean, Ring of Honor, uh, like I said, it, half my adult life has been with specifically Ring of Honor. It's the first company that ever gave me a break. Um, it's the first company that ever put me on, on truly national TV. So I, I'd love to continue. And uh, I'd love, it, there seems like a lot of people put a lot of effort into it in, in less than favorable circumstances to not, you know, I, I'm just hoping all of those people, myself included, get a shot um, with an ownership that cares about it, that is willing to sink some money into it, that is willing to uh, maybe appreciate it in, in different ways than, than the previous group had. Well, one of the things that, that I will always say that Ring of Honor had that a lot of the bigger companies, as they went on to sports entertainment, uh, Ring of Honor filled that gap of what pro wrestling fans, real pro wrestling fans wanted for pro wrestling. I've always thought it was like a conscious effort by that group. And maybe you can clear that up for me. Was that like a group conscious with you guys, with the wrestlers, with the, the office, with the, with the commentators, with everybody that this, we're going to do a pro, an actual pro wrestling show, because this is going to be sort of the opposite of what's happening with this sports entertainment. Yeah, I, for sure. Um, I know when, when Carrie Silken owned the, owned the company, uh, from 03 to 2011, that was, that was the MO there. It was, let's get literally the best wrestlers. We'll have some stories and, and they had some good ones. Um, you know, I think of Jimmy Jacobs and, and Lacey, that, that romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, I think of, uh, CM Punk versus Raven, how, how violent that got, oh, man. um, just, you know, and, and there were stories, don't get me wrong. CM Punk and Samoa Joe, the best of three. Um, just three incredible matches. Uh, Summer Punk, um, Brian Danielson's World Championship reign, Homicide, uh, just at every turn, uh, being the flag bearer for Ring of Honor. So there were stories, don't get me wrong, but um, you could also see, you know, uh, Doug Williams, you could see Chad Collier, you could see, um, you know, John Walters, guys that weren't household names that were really good wrestlers that didn't really fit the profile of what WWE was looking for at the time. Well, I, I just needed just to interrupt you. I'm sorry. But I mean, yeah. if, if that wasn't the culture around there, I don't think we would have seen the evolution of the Briscoes, the evolution of the Young Bucks. I don't think because I don't necessarily know if they they could have done what they've done in a totally, completely different company. Absolutely. Yeah, that was that definitely was the driving force and the driving factor. And Ring of Honor was always lucky because they've always had uh, executive producers or, or matchmakers or bookers or whatever you want to call it that have had that same vision, um, one way or the other. And, you know, it started out with Gabe Sapolsky, uh, who, you know, gets a lot of credit, well-deserved for, uh, making a lot of the matches. Although if you talk to Kerry Silken, he'll, he'll remind you that, uh, Gabe often ran the tab up, <laughs> which was fine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ring of honor wasn't the most profitable venture for a long time, but, um, and then you had Adam Pierce who, who looked at it the same way. Uh, and, and he helped really the rise of, of Tyler Black, of Kevin Steen, of those guys. And then, um, you know, into the Sinclair era with, with Delirious, Hunter Johnston, mm -hmm. who really, uh, you know, for, aside from, you know, maybe suggesting a finish or maybe suggesting a sequence here or there, 
really just left it up to the talent to have the best match. And very rarely was there any specific instruction to not just go out and tear it down. You know, um, there's, I think there's different places on the card, maybe the opening match, you, you really want to go, you know, all out, but save a little bit. And I think you want to make sure the main event that no one is doing the same finishing move or no one's uh, stealing one of the main events, finishing moves to really heighten the importance of, of what you're going to see in the main event. But um, that environment has has led to some amazing matches. Like you said, the Briscoes, the Cena Generico. Um, I, one of my favorite matches I called last year was the Briscoes versus Taven and Mike Bennett at final battle. And they just, they just went until their gas tanks were empty. Um, you know, Jonathan Gresham versus just about anybody, whether it's Brody King, yeah. Dragon Lee, <laughs> you know, and, and that culture has really been the consistent threat over 20 years. I, I want to talk about WrestleMania weekend. We are now a week kind of removed from it, from when this is airing and super car, super card of honor was to me, stole the show. I, I sat down not knowing what to expect. I I'm not a dirt sheet guy. So I didn't get a idea of like what the setup is going to look. Cause I'm a nerd. I love the ring setup and the lights. I didn't know if it would be, you know, a different feel of what we normally got with the ring of honor stuff under kind of, the Tony Khan regime. Now, when you were going in, when they said, Hey, do you want to do this? Was that kind of in the back of your mind too, of, are we getting the ring of honor that I, I was part of, or is this, is this going to be a new presentation of the ring of honor that we're going to see kind of a preview of? Sure. And I'll give you, I'll give you a scoop that was kind of out there, but it kind of intentionally faded away on purpose. Um, this event was intended to rebrand and relaunch before it was purchased by Tony Khan. Um, there was a logo that I've seen that I like, uh, but I don't like as much as the logo we have now. And I don't like as much as the, the old logo that I have on my shirt here on my, on my jacket. Um, but there's a new logo out there that was intended to launch on the night of super card um, that didn't happen. Uh, and there was, there was some merchandise that went with it. Um, so those will, those are interesting. I've, I've asked the the previous ownership group if I can get some of that merch before they donate it or whatever they do with it. Um, I, I've been told they it I cannot have it. <laughs> so I'm a little disappointed. It'd be one of the rare pieces of merch. Uh, but yeah, so that that's just a scoop there. So that was the intent before the sale. Um, after the sale, one of the most comforting pieces of news was that. Uh, allegedly, and I, I'm getting my news from Dave Meltzer, I think here, which may or may not be accurate. He's usually on the money though, uh, that they bought all that Tony Khan's group bought all of the equipment, including, uh, the padding around the ring, including the barricades. And when we were doing those, um, those pandemic era, empty arena shows for me, uh, one of the major upgrades was the stuff like the barricades and the padding and and that sort of thing and i really like the look and feel of it and we hadn't got to get out in front of a, a new crowd uh too much at that point so i thought it it was true to the old aesthetic and i thought it was just a little it was enough of an upgrade to kind of still make us feel like kind of a little darker a little dirtier uh, than what you might see for national tv but still appropriate and still kind of sellable to have on a on a tv network so that was honestly a strange comfort to know when I read that, that, uh, okay, they bought all the equipment. They included the guardrails, the, the mats, the padding, everything. Okay. So this is probably going to look similar. So this is probably going to look, look and feel, uh, kind of the way it always has in a good way. Um, when I got to the building, um, I was shocked yeah, and again, in a good way. Um, I knew the security guards, they had previously worked with ring of honor. My guy, Sam was there. Uh, you know, he's former ECW security for Atlas. So that was cool. Um, he helped my wife out a lot at Starcast. We, when we did Starcast it all in, uh, brought my little, we brought our little one-year-old at the time and he helped her get in and out of the madness. So I'll always be forever grateful to, to Sam and he was there. So that was awesome. BJ Whitmer, part of the office at AEW, longtime ring of honor star, former ring of honor office guy was there. Christopher Daniels, um, I knew QT Marshall knew a lot of people from Ring of Honor. So that was also comforting to know that I was I was going to a place that, you know, even if Tony Khan was approaching it with an appreciation as a fan, there was also people that lived and breathed it that could help continue to make it 
the most authentic it, it could be. And so uh, a lot of comfort. It was like chicken soup, you know, as weird as it sounds, seeing those those gray mats and seeing those barricades. Uh, I knew that I knew that I was in a comfortable spot. I knew that there would be very few ways they could shoot the show that would make me feel like it was different. I knew the way it was set up, it, it kind of had to. It kind of almost had to look like we used to shoot it. So I was very excited that the look and feel uh, was good. We got a de our desk for the first time. God bless. <laughs> God bless uh, our, our handyman at, at the Sinclair Group, Ryan Ginley. Uh, he made us a cool like uh, gearbox road box desk that had like a monitor mounted onto it. Um, but we had an actual desk with actual like high quality office chairs to sit in for commentary, which was an appreciated upgrade. We usually had stools, uh, which at any given time um, either looked like I was 100 years old, hunched over, or it looked like, you know, I, it, you know, it, it didn't look the best. But uh, there were some small upgrades that, you know, I certainly appreciated. And like, that's no knock, you know, like I said, it wasn't for effort or talent. Um, you know, it's, when we were under the Sinclair umbrella, it it was everybody working hard, pitching as much as we could. But, um, you know, those little upgrades and up, updates made you feel, you know, made you feel wanted, made you feel important. And they put a little bit of their touch onto it that night. So, uh, you know, I appreciated that. But I did feel I felt some comfort knowing that we just had our stuff and they just kind of shot it the same. Um, and that was a real big, you know, it was like chicken soup walking in and and seeing everything was kind of set up the same. You know, I you know, when I think about your career and as you've been talking, I've been I've been sort of uh, coming to this realization of how many of the greats that we're seeing right now, the guys that are who are the men, who are the guys on TV right now have come through Ring of Honor. And the most respected of all the wrestlers had to have had had have to have had their feet at Ring of Honor at one point in time. Do you ever sit back and think, Jesus Christ, like this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy? I mean, it's anybody who's anybody today. I mean, do you ever, do you ever, d does the gravity of that ever hit you? I, I talk a lot with Carrie Silken, who you still in the and I, I say this, yeah. I say this as a fan because, yeah. I, you know, you know, and this is like a fan to fan question. If you're, you know, whatever. hundred percent a fan to fan, uh, you know, guard down. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't hide it. Um, you know, that's, that's part of the big, big attraction to me to ring of honor was that they were so good that the, the groups in the early years, um, you know, Brian Danielson, uh, CM Punk, Samoa Joe, <clears throat> and and all you know you name it they they all went on to 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 bigger platforms at some point right and even now this this new group that you see on AEW you know that are doing these these pretty big numbers these pretty good numbers uh whether it's pay-per-view whether it's television Adam Page um I've known Adam since 2014 um nicest most humble guy in the world he there's very few people that will outwork him there are very few people that will out hustle him um, he won't let you know it either. He's just kind of quiet and just kind of does his thing. And before you know it, he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. And he's, uh, he's becoming a, a great talker and, you know, world champion. And, um, but as a fan, fan to fan, it, it, it blows my mind. And, um, I'll give it a, I'll give you an example, um, of all the things that I called WrestleMania weekend, cause I did the ring of honor show and I did two with WrestleCon. Um, you know, one of the big thrills for me, I never called a low key match. And Whoa. yeah, and low key, um, you know, he's one of the OGs of the, of the Northeast and definitely the OG of Ring of Honor, first world champion. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, of all the things I was looking forward to FTR Briscoe's Bandito, Jonathan Gresham, um, you name it. But that first night that I got there, I, I called Homicide, another one of the, you know, another, another one of the greats in Ring of Honor and low key versus versus the briscoes and to me you know as a fan it was it was like hell yeah like i got finally got to call a, a match with low key because he he doesn't wrestle as often and, and our paths don't cross as much so um that was really cool and i think about you know davy richards was another one uh the third day i was there on saturday i got to call davy richards um you know just you know that that's a thrill for me uh, and then you think of, um, you know, you know, again, 
uh, the Young Bucks who who came here. Cody, Cody, Cody made Ring of Honor mm-hmm. destination. Um, you know, Cody was a guy that came in, and when everybody said he couldn't do it or that he was too big for this company or that company, and why you're bringing Cody in, Cody popped our highest buy rate to that point ever. You know, Cody came in and he got people interested, and he made the connection with Bullet Club, and it helped Ring of Honor take off. And so uh, to see him succeed too, to, to hear that massive ovation that he got uh, and, and the masterful job of the commentary of just letting everybody hear it at WrestleMania, just letting everybody feel it. Um, you know, that's pretty neat. You know, Cody, Cody might be an exception, but, you know, think about the WrestleMania card. A Ring of Honor guy wrestled Steve Austin in the main event of night one. Uh, a Ring of Honor guy in night two had, had maybe one of the most fun matches I've ever seen against the guy from Jackass. <laughs> so, I, I mean, up and down the card, you know, AJ Styles, Damian Priest, another one, uh, you, you name it, they they most likely have come it's, to Ring It's everybody. It's yeah. literally anybody that you can, you know, you can, I mean, yeah, it's like throwing a rock in, in you know, if you throw a rock at a wrestling show, you're going to probably hit a Ring of Honor guy. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, as a fan, I mean, I, I have all the, the action figures in the case behind me. Um, you know, I have the micro brawlers. It's it's really neat because you can, you know, you can point to almost anybody that they've released in that micro brawler set. And at this point, I've either called a match with them in it or they've been through Ring of Honor for an extended period of time. And uh, it, it validates what you do. Yeah. Um, you know, every time, and it seemed like it was once a year, every time the WWE came in and swept us for talent, you knew that we had somebody in the reserve. We had an Adam Page that was going to step up. We had Damian Priest that was going to step up. Um, we got Jay White on excursion. We knew he was going to step up. Um, so we never worried about talent. We always knew that the, the cream would rise to the top. It might take a month or two to figure out which of the, the guys would, would you know, step up to the challenge. But you know, it, it, we always knew that Ring of Honor was a destination for those you know, for some of the younger, hungrier talent and that we'd get some of their best years and that there was kind of an unspoken agreement that they'd make a name for themselves and then they'd either ask for more money at Ring of Honor or they would go somewhere else and, and, and get it. I'm kind of weird where after a podcast, I'll actually go back and re-listen to it and take notes and be like, I should ask this question here. Boy, that joke didn't lay in the way I wanted it to. It happens a lot, believe it or not. Uh, for you, do you go back and listen to your own work? I mean, because I I think I would be that guy that if if I did anything, I would go back and watch everything all over again and take notes. Are are you that kind of guy, or do you just put it out in the universe and move on? Yeah, um, I once heard Jim Ross say that that he tries not to. He, uh, if I remember the interview correctly, he said he almost actively avoids it. But uh, for me, especially. At the level of experience I was brought in, I had, I had interviewed baseball players, essentially, by the, by the time I got to Ring of Honor, and I'd done very little commentary. And baseball, the... baseball players always have a lot to say, don't they? <laughs> oh, they, it, some of them, the only player that I ever met that it was, a, was a quote unquote good interview was Cole Hamels. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll just say it right. He always had something half manufactured, half from the heart. It always <laughs> landed well. It was a good sound bite. And Everybody else was kind of pull, like pulling teeth, especially minor leaguers, which I often interviewed minor leaguers who didn't want to rock the boat, who didn't want to say something to affect their call up, you know, and stuff like that. So um, they, those were usually pretty bland and pretty boring. Part of it, my fault, part of it, because they didn't want to engage in a, in a level that uh, might get them unwanted attention. <laughs> but, you know, by the time that I got to, I got to ring them on her quickly in the grand scheme of things. Um, I'd been doing wrestling for less than a year and commentary for about six months. And Kevin Kelly saw something in me and I was doing commentary at the monster factory. So um, the only way that I could learn, uh, you know, beyond bugging him was to listen to everything back. And he gave me a piece of feedback and I'd heard from other people you're going to be the best judge of you. And if you hear something that makes you make a face or or gives you kind of a physical reaction, you're going to know that you probably don't want to do that again. Um, You know, and there, there were things that as I got produced over the years, 
Um, I was encouraged to say or not say. Um, Colt Cabana helped really help me brand myself and kind of, uh, you know, I have a sign off happy wrestling. He, he helped me come up with that. He said, you know, you should, you should say something at the end of every broadcast. And so, you know, we came up with that and that's kind of a tagline, but, um, you know, just framing things, thinking about things. Um, you know, I've, I've had people say, um, you know, stay away from, you know, stay at a certain kind of reading level, stay at kind of a third to fifth grade reading level with vocabulary choices. I've had other people say, sprinkle in a big word here or there. It, it's all personal choice. Uh, it's all kind of the choice of the producer. Um, but to me, the, the best judge is honestly, um, you know, just jumping in and listening back to everything. And if something makes me go, Ooh, <laughs> or, Oh, wow. I, I, you know, I wish I would have thought that through more, um, or, okay, maybe I can phrase that better next time. And that's usually what ends up happening. Um, if I have self critique, it's okay. That didn't land quite as well, but maybe I wasn't too far off. You know, maybe, maybe I think about using three words instead of five and I hit it quicker or I let it breathe or that sort of thing. Um, as I've gotten further along, it's almost, um, you know, it's almost like in a way kind of making music. Uh, it's for me, there's the dynamics of it. And it's about when to kind of appreciate the moment, like the F FTR Briscoes match. Uh, there were stretches of that match where I was telling Caprice, I was giving him the fist, which him and I, that just means everybody quiet. <laughs> and then I'll wave him back in. Um, when we kind of feel the crowd, there was five to 10 second stretches in that match multiple times where it just felt right to hear the crowd and to let the people at home hear that. Cause I don't think there was anything that we could have said that would have translated that the way it was coming through to us. So yeah, I, I think now, you know, eight years in it's less, it's less word choice. It's less that. And it's more listening back for, did I let, did I let the moments breathe? Did I let it soak in? Um, did I start out at a 10 and, and not go down or up? And how are my vocal dynamics? Um, you know, did I match, did I match the tenor and, and kind of pace and tone of the match? And that's really, that's really what I aim for now. Kind of when I, when I listen back. Well, you know, you mentioned, you know, you've gone to GCW, you've gone to impact was one were they kind of vibe the same for you i mean what i mean is 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 was one harder to get used to out of those two because you had been doing ring of honor pretty much your whole life <laughs> yeah. as a commentator i mean was it was it was i i mean when you're a professional it can be an easy adjustment but sometimes it's just you just don't vibe with it so i guess it, uh, what i'm asking is which one did you like better yeah um <laughs> I like both for different reasons. Um, I liked impact because I knew that was a situation where the, the, the pressure was off. Mm. And what I mean by that was I got to call a handful of matches over the course of two tapings. And I was kind of coming in as the expert and I didn't have to prep for a whole show. I didn't have to think about a whole show. I didn't have to think about uh, stories for, nine, 10, 11 matches a night, um, or on TV tapings, you know, when we do these big ring of honor tapings, you know, some, sometimes we'd be doing 20 matches in a day and right. I didn't really have to, I didn't have to think about it. Um, so that was neat. And at impact, we had a lot of extra support, um, you know, for every one person backstage at ring of honor, which really was a, it was a tight knit family, but it was a skeleton crew. And we were asked to do a lot at ring of honor. Um, for every one person at Ring of Honor, felt like there's three or four at Impact, which was which was pretty neat. Um, you know, they had makeup, which I hadn't had makeup since. Geez, all in. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually uh, they, they actually put some makeup on me on the pay per view, which was interesting. Um, so Impact uh, Impact was stress free. I think the biggest stressor at Impact was, um, you know, I, I knew some of the guys, but not all. You know, at least with the Ring of Honor pay per view even though those weren't ring of honor guy, you know, quote unquote guys at some, you know, in some form or fashion, I at least had met Brian cage a bunch of times. I knew swerve. I knew Alex Zane um, impact. I'd never met Eddie Edwards and he's a former ring of honor champion. 
Um, I never met Eric Young. Uh, I briefly met Rhino years and years ago. So there's a lot of new faces with Impact. There's some stress there. Um, with GCW, there is the stress of maybe being seen as, as not authentic, right? Um, you know, there, there's this kind of, you know, I don't want to say street cred or, um, you know, Lars, I, I'm sure you're familiar with it, where there's a certain segment of, you know, the, the style that you're in that if you go too hard one way or the other, um, you know, certain fans might feel a certain way about it. <laughs> so I, I, I'd always kind of had maybe a dad vibe or a, uh, you know, a, a more kind of buttoned up vibe. And um, well, I think, I think that's good for GCW, honestly, <laughs> when you got like a guy like Kevin Gill, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and I, and I love it. <laughs> it was like, you know, he's, he's a great friend and a good old friend of mine. And his style is is completely different than you. So I, I feel like the, the contrast is beautiful. Yeah. And and Kevin, it's funny. Kevin actually called one Ring of Honor match with me in 2017. Uh, he just happened to be in Vegas. I think he was doing something either with ICP or or something related with them. And uh, he swung by the show and I said, hey, do you want to do you want to call something? <laughs> and we did a we did one match together and and we had, we gelled then and um I think I think contrast is good in commentary because uh, Caprice and I couldn't be more different and we get along real well. We're real good friends, but he's a man of the cloth and he's, uh, you know, you got all these great extra activities going on when he goes home. And um, I like to come home and, and you know, sit down here with my wrestling uh, wrestling place down here, watch watch some wrestling, play with my kids and. Uh, you know, we listen to different music, we watch different TV shows, but there's something magic when, you know, when he and I are together, at least, you know, in my opinion, where I think the contrast brings out the best in us and because we're comfortable with each other and we trust each other. So I think you're right. <laughs> but, you know, when there's when there's guys like Gringo Loco and there's guys like uh, Grim Reefer and, uh, you know, um, Moxley and AJ Gray and, and some of these guys, you know, Effie, um, who are I think are just genuinely cool. Like, I just think that the GCW guys are just, it's hard to put a finger on it, but they're, just, they're cool. And I think they're authentic. And that's, I think a lot of their vibe is just people feel like rightfully that these guys are the real deal. So I just wanted to go in and, and be myself and make sure, you know, just try to give off that vibe too. Um, I, I, was hoping I didn't come off like Steve Buscemi that that meme where he's got the skateboard and the backwards hat. Uh, <laughs> but you know, if, if Jeff Jerry could pull it off, which he did, and Jeff's a, a dear friend of mine, um, I felt like I was going to be all right. So, <laughs> well, listen, we got a couple more questions before we jump into what I only call the hottest game in all of podcasting that we're about to play with you. We all didn't right. tell you surprise. Uh, I, I'm going to bring it down and, and ask you a, a serious question here. And in wrestling, when a guy gets released, he goes through his 90 days. He can go out to any indie promotion, get paid, wrestle, and make a living. I don't feel like that opportunity is there for a announcer. When Ring of Honor goes under, uh, the indie promotions aren't bringing in Ian Riccoboni to uh, – unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So – is, is there a, a lot of pressure? I don't even really know where I'm going with this question, but yeah. I mean, is there a lot of pressure now? Like, all right, I got to find bookings or a job, or I know you mentioned earlier, you're still getting paid with Ring of Honor, but as an announcer, how do you supplement or how do you continue in wrestling without, we've seen a ton, ton of great announcers just kind of get forgotten because they're not on TV for six months. Yeah. Yeah. Um... One of them to me was Tom Hannafan, uh, right out of the gate. Uh, Tom Phillips, who's Impact's announcer. Mike Tanay. Thankful, yeah, Mike Tanay, Scott Hudson, um, Kevin Kelly for a long time. Um, you know, Kevin was off TV for a number of years, and you know, thankfully, Ring of Honor. Uh, you know, Jim Cornette was always a big fan, and Jim got Kevin in, and and you know, re really resurrected his career. He's won numerous awards and and so on. So. Um, so it does happen from time to time. What's interesting with it is to me, and, and this is kind of completely serious, when um, when AEW first started, uh, the 
the group there had had reached out on the last night in Philly that they were in in Ring of Honor, and they just said, "Hey, you know, keep your options open. You know, um, you know, don't sign anything, kind of thing. You know, and we'd like to talk to you and and give you more information when we can." And at the same time, I was uh, being courted by somebody from WWE, and you know, Ring of Honor was, you know, this is going into 2019. Um, you know, Ring of Honor is kind of where I wanted to be. And uh, I, I knew that. So there was this this weird pressure um, to n- intentionally not burn a bridge. And so uh, I used the information the best that I could to, to negotiate with Ring of Honor without ever having to take a meeting to tell the other two groups no, <laughs> without ever having to say, hey, this is where I'm at. Um, you know, I didn't want to waste their time if I knew that I was going to stay with Ring of Honor. But I also felt in the year or two that I'd been with Ring of Honor that my stock had risen, you know, kind of since my last contract. So I was just hoping for a fair offer. And, you know, I I got one. But there was a moment after I did Madison Square Garden a couple months after that, where I thought, man, if if it ends today, I did okay. And and I'm okay with that. And I kind of knew in the pit of my stomach and in my heart that AEW was going to be something that changed wrestling and it was going to be changed, certainly change how ring of honor operated. Um, It was going to change how impact operated and even how WWE operated. And, you know, for me, I I knew there was a chance that, you know, the last contract I signed with ring of honor might be my last contract in wrestling as, as morbid as that sounded, because I had made the decision, um, you know, stay with ring of honor and not take meetings with WWE and not, and not take meetings with, with AEW. So I knew, I knew there was a shot that I I might be writing my own kind of death certificate in a way if ring of honor didn't work out. And that was a choice I was okay with because I knew at least I was kind of guaranteed Madison square garden, um, which always been a big goal of mine. Um, I I thought I would have had to go into WWE to do that. And so that was really cool and that was neat and uh calling uh iwgp heavyweight title match um another goal of mine which was crossed off on the same night and i was just i was going to give it my best effort and see where it took us but i knew in the pit of my stomach i knew in my heart and i knew with my brain that if a if a billionaire investor was willing to put the money into it and the show had the potential to be on cable television it was going to be hard to fail especially with somebody that loved wrestling and that that would drastically change how the ecosystem worked. Um, you know, that said, uh, I've kind of come to peace. Uh, there was almost this weird relief when they said ring of honor was going on hiatus because as we continued, um, every roadblock we faced with ring of honor, I thought, well, this is it <laughs> every road, but whether it was anything from, any kind of claim anybody made to uh, the pandemic, to us taking a four month sabbatical from taping because of the pandemic, to us um, having fans, to going back to no fans, to uh, everything kind of in between. Um, The Sinclair Group buying $10 billion worth of TV stations, uh, the regional sports networks, and then not panning out. Everything along the way, I kind of thought, all right, this is gonna be it. and you know, once they said hiatus, I, I kind of came to peace with if this is it, this is it. And uh, I was shocked when the news broke. And then within 24 hours, uh, I was called by Kevin Kelly uh, for the New Japan stuff. Excalibur texted me and, and let me know that he, he thought the world of me and that he thought I was going to be OK and that to let him know uh, what where I was going and, and what my status was and how he could help. Um, you know, Scott, when Scott Demore reached out the day after Christmas and said, Hey bud, you want to come in and <laughs> we'll get you a plane ticket. Um, it's just this kind of series of playing with house money <laughs> at this point where I kind of already anticipated, you could kind of see the writing on the wall and you wanted to be a team player. And I I'm, I'm ring of honor for life. I, I don't really mind who owns it at this point. Um, you know, the, the, the letters on the front of the Jersey are, are more important than the name on the back. 
Uh, although I'd like the, I'd like them to pair together. I'd like Rick Cavani and, and Ring of Honor to pair together. Um, but yeah, if, if this is it, uh, you know, I, I keep my one foot in kind of the, the civilian world and uh, I make the wrestling work in addition to that. So if this is it, I, I had a heck of a run. And, you know, I think to, to Joey Styles, who had eight years on TV, and and I got eight years and, and that he got eight years in that first ECW run. And, you know, I got eight years on the, on the first ring of honor run. So, um, you know, whatever it holds, uh, I'm, I'm good with it. Like I, I, over time, I think I found peace with it. And so if it all ended tomorrow and they called Joey styles to replace me, I'd be sad. <laughs> I'd be real. I'd be real sad. Uh, but I'd, I'd be all right with it. And there's a local group here in Allentown that runs, and they told me they'd have me in at any time. I'd be getting paid less, a little less than Ring of Honor, just, just a little, but that's all right. Um, I'd probably still try and stay involved with wrestling, but I don't think I'd chase anybody or knock anybody's doors down. You know, I, I'd love to, if Ring of Honor's not the right fit, I'd love to continue the New Japan Strong stuff. Um, I'd love to pop in here or there GCW. Uh, but, you know, I, I think I found peace with, you know, the, the idea of, what happens if Ring of Honor goes away or changes? Lars, do you have a question? Well, you know, I was thinking, you know, how rich Allentown, Pennsylvania, how rich rest, how much of a rich wrestling history that that's in that town. And I guess my final question of the night, as I want to kind of go back, um, were you able to see any of the WWF stuff or the WWE stuff that would come through Allentown? Because I know that's where they did a lot of their TVs, obviously the, the Jimmy Snuka incident, I think, was yeah. Allentown. You know, so you know, there's a there's a lot of connection to that city. Yeah, and the uh, the Eddie Gilbert car car crash was right on uh, Route 22, coming through Allentown, just outside of it. Way to bring um, it down. Yeah, and, but he, he 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 had a great comeback, and then when he came back in Allentown, uh, they misannounced him as Billy Gilbert, which is really funny, and you should check that clip out if you haven't oh, seen it. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you what, man. One time. I was when I was still with the Bastards, we were playing our hometown or San Francisco playing at the Maritime Hall. And there I saw it was uh, Lance Ferguson and the Bastards <laughs> in the newspaper. And I was like, OK, humility, here we come. Yeah, I I pulled one of those at Supercard. Uh, I, I misannounced Denise. So say I threw it to Denise Descalzo, uh, but it's <laughs> Denise Salcedo. So <laughs> it happens. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's really embarrassing. I, I, I apologize profusely and then reached out, but um, the Allentown piece, I, I just missed the TV tapings, but from 1991 on uh, my parents took me dad, dad hated wrestling. Why are you into this? Why are you into this? Um, but it's funny because it led to, and he, I love my dad and he's love my mom. They're great parents. Um, they, they really set me up, you know, gave me a good, real good shot. Uh, but the only time my dad, I remember, you know, my dad will do stuff like, Oh, I, Oh, I changed your oil. And that's how he'll show you. He loves you. Right. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> the only time I remember him ever saying he was proud of me was when I, when we toured England, uh, for the first time. And he said, man, you, you got to leave the country. I said, yeah. He said, they pay for that. I said, yeah. He said, I'm, I'm proud of you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, which is really cool. Cause he, uh, he, he did the music thing for a bit. Uh, he opened up for a lot of the local, he, uh, he was a local act that opened up for a lot of the kind of the medium sized names of the time, like Todd Rundgren, uh, like Derringer, um, head East, um, you know, some of the groups that would come through Muhlenberg college or Lehigh or, or things like that. Um, is that so, where you got is that where you got exposed to Nick Lowe for Christ's sake? Yeah, Nick Lowe. I mean, because I was I, about to say you're 35 fucking years old. How the hell do you know about Nick Lowe? You know what I mean? I love it. And I, I, I barely know about Nick Lowe and I'm 50. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I, I man, my dad was into decent music. Uh, and my and my brother was my brother was into rancid. And so I loved you guys. Uh, oh, thank you. you know, Operation Ivy also. So I I was hearing stuff kind of before my time. <laughs> so that's fair. That's fair. It was, it was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, he was just, you know, he said he was proud of me for doing that. So, but he used to take me to the Allentown Fairgrounds and 
They used to tape at Ag Hall, which is still there. They do these weird kind of garage sales. They just had like an animatronic dinosaur exhibit that was really cool uh, that we took the kids to. So it's still there. You can still see it. You can see where Sergeant Slaughter drove his camouflage limousine through the, the back door. Um, oh my God. Looks identical. The concession stand still has what looks like the same pictures from 1978, you know, with the French fries and the hot dogs. Um, and then they would do every summer, they'd do a big show out in the fairgrounds in the, um, you know, the outdoor area. And that's where Andre would, you know, he'd always win the battle Royal there. Bob Backlund would always defend the belt. And then later I saw the, the Mountie and big boss man in the steel cage. Um, Whoa, that yeah, must've been yeah. a winner. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a good one. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, they moved him from Allentown to Bethlehem, which is not far. Yeah, I mean, they're sister cities, um, and those went to Stabler. So they started doing TV uh, occasionally there, about two or three times a year. And so, um, you know, we're talking 93 to 99, and then WCW started to come, and then ECW started to, to come up to Allentown in 97. So I saw it all. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, as a kid, my mom really knew that that was my thing. You know, he each kid kind of has like a, a thing and she could tell that wrestling meant a lot to me. So, you know, my dad would, would usually find a way to work that night or something to get out of it. And then my mom would take me to wrestling most of those, mostly so she could see like Rick rude or edge, you know, those are her favorites. <laughs> so she didn't mind it at all. Cause she was seeing, she was seeing the rip guys in the spandex. So <laughs> that's fair. Well, let's wrap this up with the greatest game ever. It's called Guess What Ian Riccoboni is Watching on TV. Basically, Lars and I, we have three rounds. We're going to guess, not knowing anything about you, what you're watching on TV. People seem to love it. Guests seem to enjoy it. So here we go. Lars, you're what, four and one right now? Uh, something. I like. I don't think you have a win, bro. I, I had the first win, and then you've just completely run the table since. Oh, well, I just do my my research. I look on Wikipedia. So long ago. Uh, <laughs> I will lead it off. And uh, I'm going to be the heel here. I'm going underhanded and take one of Lars's guests, Ozark. Oh, I it's on my list. I, I have not oh. watched Ozark. Yeah, I've not seen it. How old are your kids? Oh, oh good so God. <laughs> Five and three. Five, Five and, three. and three. Okay, so you cheater, boy, cheater. Boys, boys or girls? Or uh, Zach, Zach is five and Nora's three, so one of each. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna go uh, Paw Patrol. Watch it this morning. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> you knew exactly what you were doing, <laughs> you dirty dog. Oh God. Turn it. I'm, I, you know what? I'm not taking the low road. I'm still going adult themed shows here, which does hasn't helped me since. Um, boy, you like to laugh. I'm gonna say Arrested Development. I've watched it. I've seen it the whole series. So I'll, I'll count it. I haven't watched it re recently, but I've seen I've seen the whole series. No. Doesn't count. No, it doesn't you, count. You, okay, you, it's only recent. You, listen, stuff. listen, Mister Rickenbacker. <laughs> I can see one back there. Um. Only you don't reason. get to change the rules. Yeah. Okay. Only I know reason. you can. <laughs> All right. So that's one for me. Zero for Dennis. Yeah. So, I, and so, okay. Uh, okay. You're married. You got kids. I'm thinking you're probably watching something like, or you, you, you have been, because you're probably watching some TV with the old lady. Am I correct? That, so that's a we're gonna have to yeah we're gonna we're gonna go the bachelor or the bachelorette one of the two. Oh no not this season not recently okay okay yeah. okay so well, this is your chance to tie it dennis i am going for the easy layup with bubble guppies no our kids have aged out of bubble guppies we used to used to all the time but uh yeah you said aged, aged out is this, is this is this is this a win for LF or yeah. for or, Lance? Uh, Way to go, Lance! Lance, <laughs> Lance Ferguson to you, pal. <laughs> Derek Donnell. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
Well, th- wait. So did we get three? We, no, we, no. We you asked? still have a. You you can kick me in the balls with this guess if you want. Off oh, with this next one. Okay. So all right. So he's well, going for it too. He, let me think. Let me he think. does not play fair. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let me ask you this one question: Do you have a cable TV, Direct TV, or do you do streaming? Well, we have Hulu. Hulu. Oh. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna go with uh, what's on Hulu. I'm gonna say that you guys watch the reboot of Sex in the City. We do. We we see it all the way through. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. And if you need Bam. me to cut that out, I will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was hoping. I was hoping he was going for the uh, the Amanda Seyfried show, which is also the. Uh, which is also on Hulu, but uh, yeah, another Allentonian. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little envious. She's the Allentonian, so. <laughs> That's bullshit. We got to get that overruled. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian, where can people find you uh, if, you know, they're looking for an announcer for anything? Ian Riccoboni yeah. available. Sure. At Ian Riccoboni, um, Ian Riccoboni at Gmail for any any inquiries and uh yeah i'm i i'm feeling all right about what's to come um i'm hopeful for the future and uh my phone is my phone is on as i as as i was advised as i left the building on friday night so you know Good. fingers crossed and uh here's here's to many 20 years of ring of honor and, and 20 more well go see lars frederickson in a town near you and if he's not in a town near you you go to where he is and make it near you because you have to see lars frederickson dates are scrolling at the bottom do not miss out lars frederickson on tour this has been the wrestling perspective rate subscribe download do all that other crap we don't care for you guys the show's over we're going to say our goodbyes off the air ian thank you so much for hanging out with us i appreciate it thanks so much for having me